uh, some pep talk. Um, and first, if you Google Bayonet applet, so a lot of the things we're doing here, we will do them manually. Um, but there is a lot of software out there that allows you to not do things manually, especially when you go to large graphs, you're not going to be, do be doing these by hand. However, I do require you to learn to do the small ones by hand because that's my only way of knowing that you actually would understand what the big soft what the software in the large graph is doing. And so if you Google Bayonets, and I, sh I should upload this to the Google group, you'll get, for example, there's a, an AI space for those of you doing 322 uh, applet. I quite like this one from CMU. Um, it's an old one that um, if you click in Java base, it takes you to an applet that you can run online. And the applet pretty much looks like um, it's, a, it's a very nice um, interface. So it's a graphic interface. It allows you to uh, draw nodes. So you can go create. And you can add a variable here, and another variable, and another variable, and another variable. And you can then, just by clicking, you can draw a graph. So today we will spend the whole lecture using a graph that looks like this. And, and then you can basically enter evidence. So you click, oh wait, edit a variable. And then you can go and enter evidence. So you can call the variable, I don't know, uh, sprinkler. And then you can, what else can you do? You can edit a function, so you can actually go and edit the node, and you can say the prior probability should be 0.1 and 0.9, apply, and then close. And you do that for each node. It also allows you there to enter the conditional probability, so 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, their tables, the only thing is the tables here, his tables are upside down. So they should have that to one like this. And then you close. Um, and anyway, you build a graph. And then if you want to observe a node, you just click on it and you make it observed. OK. And then you can then query. You can go, given that that's observed, let's query this node. And then it gives you the probability of that node. Okay. So you could very easily code the graph that we do in class in a GUI and you can basically edit it and play with it. So with a four node graph, you'll be able to do all this by hand. Um, and this is a way, by the way, to check you, the answers to the homework question. Question one of the homework, I basically ask you to do this. So you can actually double check the answer to, that you're getting the right answer just by using this, uh, just by running the Java base. So Java base, easy to find. Um, there's better software out there. There's like in Vancouver, there's Norses. It's a company, local company, that actually just specializes on um, software. And they, of course, focus on mining and so on. Um, a lot of the slides that I used as uh, the examples come from this company called Bayesia. And they have stuff on industry, health, strategy, risk managing, marketing. Uh, the, the sort of the fashion application that I had comes from here. So you can go to marketing and then you can see all the applications and you can read all about how they do marketing and fashion and the whole thing with Bayesianets. Uh, so just by knowing the small graphs, you'll know what happens with, especially after today's lecture, what happens with the big graphs and you can very easily you have, you know, there's companies built on this technology, so this is practical uh, things to know. Um, there are also things that, not, that are not directly graphical models, 
but for which you do need probability. Like an example is, um, let me show you here, toward the end of the course we will be able to have models that given a set of points, like those colored points on the left, they will be able to tell us what's the probability that a point that is in a particular part of the space will be red and not green. So we will be able to compute these. We will have these sophisticated models. Um, the message here is they use probability. So we need to learn to manipulate probabilities in order to be able to understand these models. Um, and you need to understand these models to be able to understand uh, things that you know, a lot, you know, to do cool stuff, as you can see, and to understand stuff that we kind of use almost on a daily basis, like in this case the Kinect. Okay, so the Kinect requires that you learn, that, that you understand like some basics of probability in order to know how it works. And it's very simple concepts. We're actually going to cover the algorithm of the Kinect, the machine learning algorithm of the Kinect at the end of the course. That's where we're going to, and you can use it to connect automatically recognizes what's a shoulder, what's an arm, and so on, and that's how it predicts where you are. Um, connect, by the way, who's played with a Connect? Okay, most of you. For those of you who haven't played with Connect, it's this thing that you put, like a thing that looks like this, you put it on top of your TV, and then you can start playing games, and you don't need to hold wires or anything. Um, because it has a sensor, that it's a 3D sensor. Um, it just actually puts a grid on, it's an active sensor, it puts a red grid on you, the infrared sensor. It works at night as well because of that. Um, and, and then it uses machine learning to predict the exact positions of your body, of your shoulders, like in this cartoon. Where is your shoulder, where is your head, and so on. And if you can predict I mean, this is sort of for fun and entertainment, but you can also use this in medicine because you might want to predict where your kidneys. Um, an important part of surgery is be able to predict where specific organs are and so on to, to help doctors, you know, find problems. Or to be able to detect tumors, you know, irregularities. Um, our healthcare system cannot handle the number of patients that come, and that's why you probably hear on the news there's long waits, not enough nurses, um, and so on. So, being able to automate healthcare to a large extent will um, help us with um, dealing with the challenges that we're facing. And, and the challenges are huge because most of us are getting old and we're not having enough children. And you know, it's growing exponentially. There's going to be a problem. And so it's very important to get um, to use as much of the technology, as much as we can use technology to improve um, health care. Um, the point here, though, it's this sort of this is the end goal. This is where we're going. Toward the end of the course, I will have these algorithms. But to get there, we need to learn the basic probability. Not just because that probability is immediately applicable, but because other applications build on this. Okay. So this is sort of essential to get there. Okay. Having said that, let's begin with uh, what we were looking at. And so today we will do inference. So again, here's a graphical model that consists of four variables. Um, it's called the sprinkler network. Um, and for whatever reasons. Um, and so clouds influence rain and influence that the wet grass gets wet. Um, but then your, the probability of you switching your sprinkler on or not depends on whether it's cloudy or not. So that's basically, this graph indicates all these influences. Um, we can draw, so when you look at this graph, um, you should think of this over here as the probability of C, P of C, and so this I often also write P of C equal as a table, and I 
we just write 0 0.5, 0 0.5. This is the probability of it being false, the probability of it being true. So 1 is true, 0 is false. And I usually put a C here to indicate that it's over C. So in other words, the probability of C equals 0 is 0 0.5. We also can draw this with a diagram where we have C and here we have P of C on the vertical axis and then we have 0, we have 1 and this would be just two bars, a two bar histogram with height 0 0.5. Okay, both of them 0 0.5 because probabilities add up to 1. Um, likewise, um, this table here is to be interpreted as a conditional probability of the sprinkler given cloudy and if you look at that let's do this example with a different color um, then you can tell that the probability of the sprinkler given that cloudy is true or one is 0 0.9, 0 0.1. This is a distribution over S being either false or true. Okay. So reading a condition with your condition, your condition on the fact that um, it was cloudy and when it was cloudy you only have a distribution <coughs> over S. So it's important to note this. When I write this, this is not an object of two variables, but it's, it's a distribution over S. Okay. So if I sum over S, P of S given C equal 1, I get 1. And that should be obvious from that picture. If 0 0.9 plus 0 0.1 is 1. We can also draw that. I can use a graph. And in this case, I would use a big bar that's 0 0.9. And I would use a small bar that's at 0 0.1. And this would be P of S given C equal 1. And this is a distribution over S. Finally, and, and then the same would apply for probability of rain given cloudy and probability of wet given both sprinkle and rain. Now wet now has two parents, so it's, it has, uh, there's eight values to describe it, eight numbers I used to describe it, of which you only need four because it's a conditional uh, table. Uh, one last thing I wanted to add here is that if you want the probability of uh, C and let's say S, the joint, then that's going to be a table. Zero, 01, zero, 01, this will be S here, this will be C here, but then the numbers are the probability, so the entry here, the first entry uh, in the first cell, zero, 00, is the probability of C being 0 and S being 0, so it's the probability of both being 0, both being false, and that's just 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, okay, because we have a 0 0.5 here times a 0.5 here, because here this guy is 0 and here the guy is 0 to 0, so that will be 0.25, this one is 0.25, let's do another color here, purple, this one is 0 0.9 times uh, 0 0.5, so it's 0 0.45, and then the last one will be 0 0.05. Okay. Note now that all the numbers add up to 1. 
it's a joint table. So it's a probability of S and C. It's a, it's a 2D distribution. Go um, ahead. When you multiply uh, probabilities in an AND statement like that, uh, don't they have to be independent variables? So I'm sorry, so uh, sprinkler is independent of cloud. Sprinkler is not independent of cloud. It's not. So the rule that I'm using when I multiply, thanks for the question. Um, the rule that I'm using is like, for example, if I want the probability that the sprinkler is not on and, and that it's not cloudy, that's equal to probability, using conditional probability, sprinkler being zero and C being zero times P of C equals zero. That's how I filled in the table. There's no independence. Independence would be if I said S, just P of S times P of C. Yeah. Okay. So the way I'm filling in the tables is by multiplying probabilities. It's just using conditioning, the rules of probability. Okay. So that's how this entry comes to be. And then all the other entries, I was using the same rule. The joint is the marginal times the condition. Just like we did before for um, the, the patient example where you had a test and you needed to know whether you should be worried or not. Um, when we plot these, so we can draw a graph of this as well, but now it's a joint distribution. So P of C and S is now in 2D over both C and S and then drawing it requires a little bit more effort. So let's pick purple to draw it. So let's see how well I can draw this. So we have two boxes that have height 0.25. Right? I have a box that has height point, oops, I have a box that has height 0.45, so that's a taller box, and then I have a smaller tiny box up down here, okay, so sort of four blocks, two blocks of the same size, a tall block, and then, then a very uh, uh, short block. So that's basically it. So that's all the syntax about what's in the graph. Um, one other thing of syntax that I mentioned before, but it's probably worth mentioning. You should read this as P of W given S and R together. Okay. So uh, the the given operator has precedence. So when I say given, I'm basically slicing a table. And the same is true for all tables. So if I say for this guy here, P of W given S equals 0 and R equal 1, I will get a table of a 0 and 1. It's a distribution of a W only. Again, it sums to 1. Okay, now I'm going to put this to you guys. What's the number in the first entry of this table? Is it point 0.1? Are you sure it's not point 0.99? How many people think it's 0 0.9? Hands up. 0.99. 0 0.1. 0. All right. I want you to get in groups of two. And I want the person, because half of you know the answer, and half of you either are too shy to put your hand up, but if you are shy, I have no way of knowing whether you know the answer. 
So we're going to take five minutes off because I cannot continue the course until we are okay on this. And so we're going to take five minutes off and you're going to explain to your friend why it is point one. Let me first make sure that it's point one. <laughs> uh, S is equal to zero. So it's, it's false. So it's zero and one. So we're in this case. Zero and one. But you want water to be You're both in agreement. I'm going to stop you now and I'm going to ask how many people believe it's point one? If you don't have your hand up now and you don't have anything to do the next hour, I strongly suggest you come to my office hour because you are lost in this course. And so you should be coming to my office hour so I can go over this example with you again. Um, but given that the majority is following me, um, we are indeed just slicing the table. And so this is all the syntax. This is all you need to know about GraphML. If you know all this, then you know everything that you know to be able to understand the object that we're manipulating, um, the probabilities. And the probabilities, you can think of them as, you can write them as tables, you can write them as, um, you can write them as uh, in numbers, in, in vectors, um, you can draw diagrams, and they're all equivalent. They're just different ways of communicating the same thing, that you have uh, an object that can be true or false, and you don't know whether it's true or false, and we're using probability to measure the certainty about it being either true or false. So it's, probability is just a way of measuring uncertainty. Um, in, your, in your syntax for writing probability of W given X, comma R, does that mean it's a probability of W given bracket s equals 0 and r equals 1? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Precisely the, the bracket here. Okay, so uh, conditioning has precedence. One of the things that I'm confused about is if the sprinkler, we say if it rained, wouldn't it for sure be wet? Pardon? Um, looking at the third row, so it did rain, right? Rains true. Yeah, it rains. So the probability that the grass is wet when it rains is 0 0.9. It's not one. You're questioning the numbers, so that's a different story. Uh, questioning the numbers. This could be grass that's in the shade, or there's you know there's a tree, and the grass might not get wet. Maybe it's only when there's a torrential rain. We will learn how to learn these numbers automatically from data. You record data every day. You measure the amount, whether the grass was wet, whether it rained, <laughs> and so on. And from that, you will learn these numbers automatically. That's going to be the learning part. But before we do learning, because learning requires inference, we will first learn to do inference. OK, so the rest is manipulation. So the first kind of question I might ask is a marginal probability. And this is one that's important to get. What's the probability that s equal 1? Any suggestions on how we can compute this? So now we begin to do what we call inferences. 
computations from we've specified the graph and once you specify the model you use a GUI to specify the model you enter your numbers by hand or you learn the numbers from data uh, but once you have that model you need to answer questions given that a node takes a value what are the other nodes or, or what's just the marginal probability of um, in this case what's the probability of the spring lever being on Hmm? The model is here. Okay, so let's start asking you folks. Condition you like sum over all the possible. Thank you. That's the right answer. When you don't know what the other variables are, you need to sum over them. To be able to know what's the probability of s equal one. I need to sum over C, R, and W. And they each go from 0 to 1. They can only take two values. And then it's the probability of C, and R, and W, and S equal to 1. So C, R, W are variables. S is fixed. We know that S is 1. I just want to know the probability of S being 1. So that's marginalization. It doesn't matter how many variables you don't know. You just sum them all. Okay? What's the cost of the computation here? How many operations do I need to do? Eight. Eight, eight sums. Because they're nested sums. Now. I can rewrite this as sum over C, sum over R, sum over W. And instead of writing uh, from C equals 0 to 1, W equals 0 to 1, um, I'm going to be lazy and I will just write C and R and W. Okay. And this is often the practice in papers. When you read papers, people are lazy, they don't put in all the numbers. So if you see this, if it's the sum of a C, you have to assume that it's summing over all the possible values that the variable C could take, which in this case is just binary 0 and 1. Now, the first simplification we need to do, we, we can exploit, is the, the graph. Now, what's the probability of this graph? It's the probability of each node given its parents. Okay, and it's a product of, and so we have, um, we have P of C, Um, P of S equal 1 given C. P of R given C. And then P of uh, W given S being equal to 1. And R. Okay. So that's just by reading it off the graph. It's a probability of a variable given its parents. And C does not have parents, so it's just a variable. Okay. Now, the reason why I've written it in this way is because I have all these guys. I, this is P of C. This is P of S given C. This guy here is P of R given C. And then this guy, finally, is P of W given R and C. So if I've written my answer in terms of those four guys, I now have all the numbers. Um, C or S? Um, the last one. Oh, that should be S. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So now, given that I have, um, given that I have those four tables. I have all the numbers, so it's just a question now of plugging numbers, right? So how could I do this? Um, let's do it the, the naive way. And so I'm going to just rewrite this quickly here. Make sure I get the right expression. So I have a sum of a C, R, W, uh, P of W given S equal 1 and R times P of 
um, s equal 1 given c um, times p of r given c and finally p of c. So I've just rewritten it. And so I need to sum over all these values of these variables that can take 0, 1. And so this would be equal. And let me start with the 0, 0 case. P of W equals 0, given that S equal 1 and R equals 0, times P of S equal 1, given C equals 0, times P of R equals 0, given C equals 0, times P of C equals 0. Okay, so I've just substituted 0, 0, 0 for because each of these guys goes from 0 to 1 plus and now let's do the 0, 0, 1 case which would be P of W equal 1 given S equal 1 and R equal 0 times P of S equal 1 given C equal 0 P of R equal 0 given C equal 0 times P of C equals 0. Okay, plus, let's do one more case, 0, 1, 0. So the 0, 1, 0 case would be P of, so the second variable is R, so this would be P of W equals 0, given S equal 1, and now R is set to 1, times P of S equal 1 given C equal 0 times P of R equal 1 given C equal 0 times P of C equal 0 <coughs> plus and now I would do the case 0 1 1 but I'm getting really sick of this so I'm going to just put three dots and I'm going to put three dots here plus 1 1 1 Okay. So there are 2 to the 3 terms in this. Okay. So you would write 2 to the 3 terms and then every time you write 2 to the 3 terms you need to do 1, 2, 3 multiplications. So that there are 2 to the 3 times 3 multiplications or floating point operations for your computer. So even this small exercise um, is um, taking quite a lot of time. It's been quite tedious. And once you have these, um, once you have this though, you can just read off the numbers. So probability of C equals 0, that's just 0 0.5. Um, R0 given C equals 0 would be R0 given C equals 0, which is 0 0.8. And then S equal 1. So we given that C is equal to 0 is 0 0.5 and W being equal to 0 given that S, S is equal to 1 and so 1 and this guy is 0 um, is 0 point, it's kind of tiny there, I think it's 0 0.4 0 0.1 So you would plug in all these numbers, you would multiply it, and you would get your answer. Now, I will ask you an exercise like this in the midterm. <coughs> Don't do it this way, because this will be you spending a whole hour doing it. Um, so if you do it what I call the brute force way, or the dumb way, it will take you forever. The cost is exponential. This problem is exponential, it's very hard. I will probably give you five variables to make it more interesting because then you will have to do 2 to the 32 um, of these terms. So exponentials are really, things that grow exponentially are really bad. It, they involve a lot of pain, a lot of work. There are a lot of work for us already with three variables and they are also a lot of work even for our fastest cloud computing um, devices. So instead we're going to do this um, oh, one more thing. Um, when you do the brute force away in code, um, how would you code it? 
Lots of? Yes. Lots of nested loops, exactly. So you can create a variable, let's call this variable prod, and then you would go for um, r equal one in steps of one, sorry, zero in steps of one to one, and then you would have four c equal zero in steps of one to one, and then four w equals zero in steps of one to one, you would write something like prod equal prod plus and then you would write that whole expression which it's p of c times p of r given c p of s given c so it was s equal one times p of w given s equal one comma r Okay, that, that would be the poor choice of doing this, okay, the, the brute force way. That's what we were doing, nested for loops. Okay, nested for loops, we know they're bad. Especially if you have 100 variables, you would have, and you saw like that fashion network or the networks of genes, um, they, they, you know, they have dozens or hundreds of nodes. And so even your powerful computer would be, hold, you know, would be thrown to the ground if you, if you code like this. Okay. Now, here's a very, what would be a smarter way of doing this? Like if you wanted to just do this, what do you think would be a quicker way of doing it? Like if you're doing the sum by hand, Let's not think of code now. S really depends on the C. It depends on the? Well, you can S you depends can on C and dependent on other way. So P of C, you don't have, you can take it outside those two first sums of R and W because it's constant over R and W. Exactly. So note, note, I'm doing the following. I'm multiplying this guy times this guy. And then I multiply it again. And there's a lot of redundancy here. And so, in particular, if this is what it all boils down to. It really is very simple. If you have to multiply A times B, and then you have to add to it A times C, that's two flops. A better way to do it is to just do this. Um, sorry one flop and that's that, that is all the intuition this is what we're doing we're going to take terms out so that we minimize the number of multiplications that we do okay so we're going to be smart about we're going to basically take like this guy p of c can walk out of this sum in fact it can go up to here we're going to take factors out So, in particular, let's write that expression again. We want p of s equal 1, and that's just a sum of a c and r and w of p of w given s equal 1 and uh, r. P of R given C, P of C, P of S equal 1 given C. Okay. Now I'm going to do this trick, which is I'm going to distribute. I will first take everything that doesn't involve a W outside the sum. So I will write this as C, R, and then I take all the terms that don't depend on W out. out of that sum. <coughs> okay. And 
I'm gonna call, I'm gonna give this guy a name. This whole sum, I'm gonna call it, uh, what was the term I used, phi. Okay. What's phi equal to? because we have a probability. R, I haven't said what R is, but R is given. We don't know what its value is, but it's given. This is a probability of a W. It has two numbers that add up to one, because it's a distribution of a W. That's, a, that's the syntax that we're using. So, this is just equal to the sum of a C and now I'm gonna, so this whole thing goes to 1, sum of a C, and then I'm gonna take C out, and P of S equal 1 given C, and then the sum of R of P of R given C, and I'm gonna also give it a name. And I'm going to call this guy Psi. And Psi is equal to? One. Yeah, ha, oh, so easy once you know how to do it. Okay, and here we kind of no longer know what to do. So we're done. So this is just P of S equal 1 given C equals 0 times P of C equals 0 plus, so we only need to loop over C. P over S equal 1 given C equal 1 times P of C equal 1. I'll let you plug in the numbers and I will just give you the answer. And I'll leave it to you to verify at home that that's the answer. It's a good exercise to practice. Um, that it only depends on C? Uh, no, very good question. No. So in this case, everything sort of simplified nicely to a 1. Uh, in general, it does. Some, for some graphs, you will have a term that will still be a vector. But then what you do is you, and this is how the program is going to work, you store that vector and you pass it to the next loop. And so now I'm going to be precise of exactly what I mean by that. So in code, you would create three vectors, psi, phi. You would initialize them to 0. Let's call it feet. Oh, just one side remark. There's another very bad coding thing I did here. I'm multiplying p of c times p of argument c times p of s equal c blah blah blah, blah times p. I'm multiplying a bunch of small numbers. What happens when you multiply small numbers in a computer? They quickly become zero. And we have a minimum number that we have, 10 to the minus 32, or whatever it is that we have in our calculators, or whatever the IEEE is. Um, sort of trivia that I don't like to believe don't like to remember. But anyway, there's a minimum number that the computer can represent and when you take products of very tiny numbers, very quickly it gets below that number and so you, you get yourself in trouble. So instead, typically this is done in log space. Okay? So you do all the logs and in log space you just add. And so you don't have this uh, issue and then you at the end take the exponent and so you don't have the issues of things vanishing to zero. That will be useful for not your next, for homework three. You will need to keep that in mind. Okay, back to this. So the way I would implement this, I would say for w equals zero in steps of one to one, um, I would say phi is equal to phi plus p of w given S equal 1 and R. And 
and then I would say for r equals 0 in steps of 1. So I'm doing the inner loop, I'm doing the loop over uh, r, and I'm storing the answer as phi. And then here I would have psi is equal to psi plus p of r given c times phi, the answer of the inner loop. In our case, phi is 1, so it's kind of redundant. But it had phi not been 1, you would have kept track of it. And finally, for c equals 0, the steps of 1 to 1, theta is equal to theta plus p of s equal 1 given c times p of c times psi and okay. this thing here is beautiful because instead of having nested loops you have a sequence of loops so you've gone from exponential time to polynomial time <coughs> not every day you can get that that's right yeah. and then theta is your final answer You can code it like this. In the first loop, what's the value of r? Oh, excellent question. Um, r is going to be both 0 and 1. Okay? So this is actually going to be two values. So often we can put this index. Likewise, c can be 0 or 1. So this is actually going to be a vector. Very good question. This is a table. So what have we done? We've traded off. We got rid of exponential computation, but we got rid of exponential computation at the expense of increasing storage. Now you need to store the phi table and, the, uh, and, and these other tables. You know, theta and psi. So that's essentially, that's what dynamic. Who's seen dynamic programming before? 320. Okay, so in 320 you use it for like graph algorithms and so on. Um, it's introduced there in more detail, but this is the essence. Um, you, you do one loop first, you store the result. Okay, and that the inner loop, um, which is precisely what we did here. We stored the result in blue. Everything that's in blue, it's the result, and that's, we call it phi. In this case, it just turned out to be really nice because it's sum to one. In some examples, it will not sum to one. And I should try to give you one of those examples for homework three. Um, and then you just keep, prop but if it didn't sum to one, then you would just propagate that value. You would, and then you would multiply. But you wouldn't be, you would still, the computation would be not, not be exponential, but it would be polynomial. Can we just use the rules that S doesn't depend on any other Oh, office hours. <laughs> S, S does depend on other variables. S, S is a variable. A variable in the graph depends on parents, children, and co-parents. C has not been given. Nothing has been given. All that's given is S is equal to 1. You can take both values of C. I will let's talk after the lecture. Okay, so that concludes this. Um, let me just finalize now uh, this lecture so that you can do the homework. Um, in general, doing this automatically, this dynamic scheduling this, in other words, structuring the graph so that you can do this automatically, requires some data structures because you need an order of the nodes. Such a data structure is called a junction tree. That's what the software typically does it does for you. Um, if your graph is a tree, this you can always use this algorithm, no matter how large the graph is. If the graph is very large and densely connected, this is an exact algorithm. So they, 
um, even the small tables will become a bit too large, so you'll have 